Welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast Series. My name is Scott Miller. I serve as your host and interviewer each week. You may also know that I'm privileged to write a book series for HarperCollins called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, where each year I publish a volume based on guests that join Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. I pick 30 people. I write a short, easy, breezy chapter about an on-site, an, um, an insight they share on the podcast. Uh, volume 1 is out. Volume 2 is also now out, featuring 30 new guests and 30 new Insights, and I'm on to chapter, or rather volume three, on the way to 10 volumes in the series. Would love to have you pick up a copy and take a little bit of a deeper dive on some of the insights our guests have shared, because typically the good stuff comes off air. With their permission, I write these books and highlight them, and who knows, maybe today's guest might even be featured in volume four. Our guest today is... A well-known household name, she is a Peloton instructor, she's a best-selling author, she is an entrepreneur, she's an icon now in what I call the One Name Club. So names like Brene, Cher, Elton, Oprah, Madonna, Barack, Tunde is in the house, Tunde OU name, Tunde OU name, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks for having me, hey Scott. Great to see you. Best intro ever. I'll take the likes of Oprah and Madonna and Elton anytime. So thanks for that. Well, it's true because I just saw all of her social media. You spent this past week at the White House with Elton John and a few other things. So you now are in the Madonna Elton Club. Tell us about your experience at the White House with Elton John. Oh, my gosh. I was invited by the White House to... Uh, celebrate Elton John and then also enjoy a, a concert. It was quite possibly one of the most incredible nights of my life. The energy was electric. And, you know, I, I, I said on Instagram, I sat right behind the bushes. To my right is Nancy Pelosi. And I thought to myself, like, the, the vast range of political views in the room and still everyone came together to celebrate in love. And so it was just such an incredible night, such a great experience. Well, technically, Nancy should have been to your left, right? And there should have been a Republican to your right, metaphorically. But good for her for crossing the aisle. Tune Day, honored to have you here today. You're known by countless millions of people around the world of being one of the most infectious and contagious and even vulnerable Peloton instructors. My wife, Stephanie, is a... Is a uh, twice daily, maybe fan of yours. I feel like sometimes she spends more time on the Peloton downstairs and upstairs, but uh, mission accomplished. Your recent book is called Speak. By the way, one of the best covers ever in publishing history. Speak, find your voice, trust your gut, and get from where you are to where you want to be. Speak, of course, stands for surrender, power, empathy, authenticity and knowledge. We'll talk a bit about that today. I wanna to talk about your journey, but I'm gonna ask you to sort of unfold your journey from uh, young Texas, Houston uh, girl to now international fitness, entrepreneurial empowerment icon. And we'll unfold some of that in some of the questions that I'm gonna ask you. First and foremost, I'd like to know, why did you write the book? I wrote Speak because I think that we are, I think we're all different but I think that we are a lot more alike than we are different. And when we are vulnerable enough to share our story, when we are vulnerable enough to fully truly share our story, then we realize those commonalities. We realize that we're a lot more alike than we are different. I think the last two and a half years with the pandemic uh, has left people feeling uncertain in so many regards, uncertain. Um, I think that the beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. The beauty of not knowing what's next is that you don't know what's next. And so then anything can be next. And uh, I felt like this was the perfect time, perfect moment to share my story of uncertainty because um, it was not knowing that that got me here. You know, Tunde, books like yours that are fairly memoirish-ish, uh, there's many of those out there. And then there are books like yours that take it a step further that have these nuggets of wisdom. I was telling my wife a week ago, I was reading your book. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is profound. I've spent three decades in the leadership development industry now hosting the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. And your book stands up there with the pantheon of great books of wisdom because you've got dozens of like stop in your track nuggets of wisdom. We're gonna share some of those today. I wanna start with the first one. 
I believe it was you were working in college at like the University Recreation Center. You were also working, I think, at an Italian restaurant or some restaurant and doing something else, three jobs, going to school, typical Nigerian-American work ethic. We'll talk more about why the Nigerians are so genius in America, because you're one of many that's burst on the scene. But you talk about an encounter you had with the woman who was, I think, your boss at the fitness center. You would walk in in the uniform, but instead of wearing tennis shoes, you were wearing pumps or stilettos. Talk about her as a transition figure. Yeah, so I worked at the college rec center at the University of Houston. The, the uniform was tennis shoes and a t-shirt. And I didn't feel myself in, in that outfit. And so I showed up every single day with my red shirt, with my red lipstick and my matching red pumps. And her name was actually Miss Wanda. And one day Miss Wanda looked at me and she kind of just chuckled to herself. And she said, what are you doing working here? And I said, what do you mean? She said, I feel like you would be one so great being one of the girls at the counter. And she was referring to the beauty counter. She told me that she had worked for fashion fair for fashion fair for many years. And, uh, you know, secretly I'd always enjoyed trying to do other people's makeup. I say trying to, because I would put my hands on anybody who would trust me or let me use their face to practice. And uh, it was her seeing something in me that I had uh, uh, kind of shunned myself away from. I, she saw something in me that I'd kind of buried down, like the secret, secret pleasure, secret joy of mine. And so that was the catalyst for me going and interviewing at one of the beauty counters in Houston Galleria. In fact, she's the essence of what our founder, Dr. Stephen Covey, calls a transition figure. Someone in your life that perhaps believed in you more than you even believe in yourself. In fact, I'm gonna read a passage from the book. You say, I don't have any experience, I told her. Who would hire me? The job seems to require skills that I didn't think I had. It didn't occur to me that I could learn on the job, that everyone has to start somewhere that I could be hired because of my potential, not because of my experience. Now, Tunde, you've gone on to become a bit of an international celebrity, and you also had, like many of us, a fairly routine job as a corporate trainer, and no doubt you have had the opportunity to interview people. Talk to the leaders that are listening today about the value of sometimes hiring on potential as opposed to just experience. Yeah, I knew that I'd never worked in cosmetics before. And I, 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 I went into the interview, rather than focusing on what I didn't have, I focused on what I did have. I knew that I'd worked as an assistant manager at a local pizza shop for some three or four years. I knew that I worked in customer service and I had people skills that I developed in the role that I was in within the rec center. Um, to the leaders, I would say, Although the candidate may not possess the specific skill that you're looking for, if they embody characteristics of the person that you see in their in the role, um, that that goes a long way. And so I was able to take my passion and my love for people, um, and I was able to to couple with couple that with the artistry. Um, to be able to, to meet their needs. I think that, you know, when you sit down, or in, whether it's your makeup artist or your, your barber or your hairstylist, half of the job is listening, is the listening skills. Um, not only listening to, to, to meet their needs in terms of what they want to look like by the end of your time together, but also allowing a space where they can feel seen. And so my, my passion and my love for people uh, is why I think that I excelled so, so far in that role. The artistry was secondary um, to the people piece. You know, makeup artist or not, I think there's a great leadership lesson in another pithy gold nugget you share. You say, there's a vulnerability to sitting and getting your makeup done. A stranger is touching your face, seeing up close those details that you usually only see in the privacy of your mirror at home. The more I did it, the more they opened up to me, telling me about their partners, their hopes, and disappointments. And then there's this line. I was able to receive and honor their vulnerability. I think that's just such a great leadership competency is to receive and honor people's vulnerability. Whether you are a supply chain manager or an IT professional or you're a makeup artist, take that a step further what it means to receive and honor someone else's vulnerability. 
Yeah, I mean, can I curse on here? It's tough to listen to people's shit, right? It is it is tough to listen to people's stuff because we're so quick to either judge it or to put our opinion on it. I say that I was I, I was open to receiving the information, meaning I was open to without judgment hear what my client wanted to say, not put my opinion on it, not rush rush to a decision, but truly and fully hear them. I think at the end of the day, we all just want to be heard. Um, and when it comes to, to building uh, client loyalty, when you can show someone that you see them and you recognize them, uh, uh, you're more apt to create that, lo that love connection, that love language, and build that loyalty and trust. Tunde, share the story about, I believe it was a gentleman who came in and I think initially he wanted a little bit of under eye concealer and then it kind of kept going and going and going and you learned a tremendous amount about how to honor his vulnerability. Share that story. It was eye opening for me. Yeah, you know, someone walked into my counter and they asked for uh, skincare and then skincare led to foundation and foundation led to a little concealer and then by the time 35 minutes had passed, I'd, I'd put a full face of makeup on this individual. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I think halfway with, within the interaction that I realized that this person um, was transgender and perhaps um, at the start of their journey. Um, that was one of, one of the many, but maybe one of the first moments where I realized that what I was doing was far beyond lipstick. Um, I was in a position where I could create space for people to be themselves, to be fully themselves, to have been um, maybe one of the first pillars within this person's journey. Um, those are the moments that those are the moments that that you can't pay for. Those are the moments that um, you recognize that each of us carries a skill, a skill that is ultimately a gift. I think that a life well lived is a life that is led in service. And when you're living in service or being of service, you're living in purpose, on purpose, and being of great purpose. My purpose in that role within cosmetics was to be able to deliver the gift of confidence. I grew up, uh, I was overweight and I, I didn't have a lot of confidence. And once I discovered what confidence was, what, what it felt like, what it looked like, what it smelled like, I felt like it was something that I wanted everyone to have. Like, like come over here guys, you've got to experience what this is. And so I was, I, I was so, in love um, in, within that role because I was able to gift people with confidence. Now I'm able to gift people with confidence by, by virtue of a bike and now by virtue of this book, um, but it, it all comes back to that, that same, same driver. Tunde, it would be a mistake for someone, even me, to call you an overnight sensation. I mean, you've been working extraordinarily hard, taking risks all your life, you left college early, not to your parents' delight immediately, and moved out to California where halfway through the trip, the job you went out for ceased to exist halfway in the car out there. And then you found another job and through, it, and through a very fortunate series of building a brand and working hard and, and having people respond to your energy, you have had some significant pivots in your career. We'll talk about those. But a, a phrase you share in the book is you say, when I look back at the biggest shifts in my life, no... When I look back at the biggest shifts in my life, doubt was always there. Think about the times when there was a big shift in your life. I guess you're going to feel the same. Uncertainty, as I've come to learn, has to give you, has to exist to give you room for a shift. Give voice, give voice to how important uncertainty is for us to take risk and grow. Uh, I'll share a story. I, so I was in cosmetics, uh, by the end I was in co the cosmetic world for 15 years, about 12 years in, I woke up one day and I had mm, the audacity to admit to myself that I hated my job. 
And I say the audacity because I'd worked my butt off for years. Um, I had my dream job on paper. Everything was great. I had my dream car, I lived in my dream neighborhood in Hollywood. Uh, people would have killed for my job. I at one point would have killed for my job. And here I was saying that I didn't like the job. I felt ungrateful. I didn't want to admit it out loud. Uh, I remember I was living in LA at the time. I was flying to New York for a work gig. And so I get to New York. I, I'm i ready to, I want to go to a workout. The hotel gym, there was like a broken treadmill and a busted hula hoop. I was like, I'm not getting a great workout in here. Kelly Ripa had been talking about indoor cycling studios and I'd never been to one. And I was in New York and I said, oh, well, they have one of those studios here. Let me go and check it out. Um, by the time I get to the class, pay for my water bottle, my seat, the shoes, I was $40 deep, fully judging myself for spending $40 on a 45 minute workout. Three minutes into the class, I'm in a state of euphoria. I leave the class that day. I'm walking from my class back to my hotel room. And within a matter of five seconds, within a matter of five seconds, I feel this wave of blue energy move through my body. Within five seconds, after my very first cycling class, I knew that I'd be cycling for the rest of my life. I knew that not only would I be cycling, but I knew that I'd also be teaching it. And without even knowing what Peloton was at the time, I knew that I would be able to impact the lives of millions of people by virtue of the bike. It was like this da divine download of information. I said earlier that the beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. I think that if I had you know, just before that time when I said I'm in a space where, oh my God, I hate my job. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, to your point, I left college early. I devoted my life to cosmetics and now I hated it. What was I supposed to do? Um, and so in this space of uncertainty, not knowing what was supposed to be next, this divine download of information, I call it this blue light experience, comes in. I think that if I think that I, I, if I had known what I was supposed to do next, whether that was go into be an esthetician or whatnot, something within the same realm of what I was doing, I think that if this same vision had come to me, the same download of information had come to me, I would have been in this state of tunnel vision. I think knowing what you know keeps you knowing only what you know. The beauty of not knowing is that you open up yourself to the thing that is actually coming in next. I think that when we think we know what's supposed to next be next, we block opportunities. We say, this doesn't fall within the path. That is not part of the plan. The great thing about my plan coming to an end is that I had no plan and that's how I was open to receiving what was actually next for me. I think that doubt, to your point, doubt's not a bad thing. Doubt feels horrible. I'll repeat, doubt feels horrible. Whether you're doubting your career, a friendship, a relationship, I don't always think, I don't think that doubt is always a bad thing. I think that doubt is a course correction trying to make way. I think that when doubt enters, it's your body's way of signaling that change needs to happen. On the other side of change is growth. And when you fully, truly, really, really surrender, allow yourself to not be in control of the outcome. Mm. I think that's when growth happens. I think that's when you, when, when, when doubt shifts and it turns into opportunity. Amen to that. In fact, you write in the book a phrase, this is really, the book is excellent, but the better part of the book is you like drop these one liners and that are golden about every four or five pages. There's hundreds of them. You write, I didn't feel entirely like a new person. I felt like the same person with a new story. And that's kind of mm -hmm. a theme throughout the book is really uh, asking yourself, at what point in your life were you copying a paragraph from a last chapter and trying to paste it you know, onto a clean page? Talk to people that are facing uncertainty, doubt. They, they don't know how to become a new person. And perhaps you might say, no, you're the same person, just a new story, new chapter. Talk to that. 
Yeah, I think it's like this this evolution of self. We're so quick to, when something doesn't work, to your point, we cut it out. We cut out parts of ourselves situation. And then we try to paste the same thing onto a new page. Um, I think in that section of the book I was speaking to, I left Houston, right. moved to California for an internship, halfway along the drive, I, I hitched a U-Haul. I had a U-Haul and my car was hitched onto the back of it. Halfway through the commute, I get a call that says the show that I'm supposed to work on is no more. The person I was going to intern for had been fired. Um, and so I could have turned around and, and just gone back to Texas, but I said, let me just see this through. And then I get to LA and now that I'm without a job, I don't know what to do. My previous boss in Texas calls the same company in LA. And so she sets up a job opportunity for me there. And so here I am supposed to go into my first day of work, never ghosted a person, much less a job in my entire life. And that morning before I go into my first day, at the same job in a different state, when my reason for moving cross country was to do something different, I decided not to go in. Uh, I asked myself, why would I cut out a paragraph from the last chapter and then try to make it work on this new page? Isn't the point of a clean page to start clean? Um, it was one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, because at that point I was refusing security. So it was the most difficult, one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made, but it was also one of the most rewarding. I mean, the age old saying big risk, big reward. Um, I, I, I would say that my life is, life is data. Like, I believe that everything is always happening for me and nothing is happening to me. Everything's always happening for me. Nothing is happening to me. So when things don't go my way, they're actually going my way because everything is always going my way. If I look back at the breadcrumbs that my life has been leaving me, the data will call it. Data shows me that I'm, it, everything always works out okay. Even when things don't go my way, ultimately it swings in my favor. Um, and this is a person who I've experienced a lot of trauma and heartache and heartbreak in my life. And so doesn't mean that life has been easy for me by any means, but I do believe that everything always works itself out. Um, and that was just, that was just another proof of it for me. In many ways, it kind of gives voice to also serendipity in life. Uh, like you mentioned, you've had some unfathomable heartache. Your one of your brothers passed early, I believe in his teens your father then passed not so long after that. Your mother passed. Obviously, as a Nigerian-American family, family is everything. But you've also had some serendipitous wins. You won the game show. What is it called? I'm sorry, what's it called? Deal or No Deal. Yeah, Deal or, deal deal or no, no Deal. I mean, I don't mean to lighten the tragedy in your life, but you won this. Talk about that and talk about kind of what a pivot point that was in your life. Yeah, that was just a, 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 a very crazy experience. I was at work. I worked at the cosmetic counter and someone came, came in and said, hey, we, we love your energy. Would you like to be on the show? And so I went and I auditioned and it was really this, it was this life changing moment. Um, I got to go on TV with my entire family. I won a car and a bunch of money. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was just, it, it was, it was a very Hollywood moment um great experience um i i think the irony of that is that i didn't know the tragedy that was just behind the, the corner my little brother passed away that same year um he was 19 years old three years after that i lost my dad and then three years after that i lost my my mom and so you know as terrible as it 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 was and it is it was almost in some way that that show money would then be um, the help that my family needed yeah. Um, yeah. in that time. And so, yeah, again, it's like these, this thing where everything was kind of happening as it was going to happen for the next thing that was around the corner that was going to happen. I think it's a great yeah. gift for you to remind us life happens for us, not to us. Very tender story in the book about you pulling up 
to the home after your brother had passed and seeing the car, your brother's car out there. I, I, was, I read that passage several times. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I wanna talk about the hair, but before we go there, you dedicate a chapter to it, I wanna talk about your role as a Peloton instructor. So for those who are you know, riveted listening and watching you today, those last few humans that don't have a Peloton in their home, <laughs> talk about, or is there anybody else that, I swear we have two. I swear my wife has, has got two somewhere in the house. Talk, so good. talk about your role as a Peloton instructor, how you got that job, what you did to leverage that into a platform beyond just as a Peloton instructor and ambassador. Talk about that whole journey. Yeah, so I, I mentioned I had this blue light experience. I knew that that's what I, I was going to be cycling. Um, I wish it was just easy, as easy as me saying that I just started cycling, but I get back from New York to LA uh, after having that, that blue light experience and imposter syndrome sat in. Imposter syndrome said, you don't look like, walk like, move like, or talk like an instructor. Who would hire you? And so I think some eight months went by before I actually went and, and um, got uh, my certification. And then some months passed after that before I actually went and auditioned somewhere. Audition, started working at a mom and pop studio. I get this DM from this guy. He says his name is Cody Rigsby and he's with Peloton and he'd love for me to come out audition. I audition, I leave the audition. He says it was the best audition he'd ever seen. A month later, I get an email that started with, we regret to inform you that we will not be moving on with your uh, candidacy. And so um, I, I went through this dark space, much like the trauma that I'd experienced in my life. This felt like another loss. It felt like another loss, not because I didn't get a job that I wanted, but because I was so sure. I'd seen something that I thought was true with certainty. I trusted myself. And I went after it. And now I realize that what I'd seen was wrong. And so it felt like a loss, loss of trust in myself, loss of trust in myself. Um, yeah, I was on a, a hike with one of my friends, Jade, and she was the one who reminded me, she laughed. She said, Tunde, your life uh, is proof that uh, whatever's coming, what I know to be true about your life rather is that whatever is coming next is bigger. Let it go girl. And so I, I carried on. And so um, I think maybe eight months later, Peloton called me back, said, will you audition? I auditioned in hindsight. I'm so happy. I didn't get the job the first time around. It's a timing thing, timing wise. And the, the leadership that I was hired under made more sense later. So again, it was all in my favor. Um, and I, I've been so fortunate that, number one, I get to show up to a job that I love. I get to show up and be the character of myself. I get to play myself every single day on TV, if you will. Um, and I, I, I've been able to utilize my platform um, in a way that supersedes just working out on a bike that goes nowhere. I don't take for granted the space um, that I occupy, not just in, at Peloton, but the space that I occupy in wellness. To be one of the most notable faces um, in within the fitness world and to be a Black woman, a Nigerian first-generation uh, uh, child of two immigrants that moved to this country to, to create a better life for their children, like, to be that here now, I, I don't take for granted. I've been able to use my platform to speak up um, against um, social issues. Um, I've been able to utilize this platform to speak with some of the most in influential uh, uh, people on the planet. Um, Wait, do you mean me? Do you mean Scott? Mill Do you mean me? Oh, okay, sorry. Just, just clarify. I wasn't living Keep until going. today. Sorry. <laughs> uh, to, to be able to utilize my platform to speak up about matters and causes um, that mean something. Um, yeah, I don't take it lightly and I, I don't take it for granted. And I, I, I recognize this, this space. There's been so many um, women who have who've reached out to me and they show me pictures of their little girls watching me on the bike, just watching. Nobody's taking the glass little girls just watching. And the moms say that they see themselves in, in me. And so I know that 
uh, for someone who I, being that I didn't see that all the time growing up, I know, I know what that means. And, um, I know the space that that holds and I don't take it for granted. Uh, just after George Floyd was murdered, I led a ride called the speak up ride. Um, 22,000 people took that ride live in that moment. And I think maybe some 400,000 people have taken that ride now. Um, I spoke up about the, the injustice that was happening in the world from my experience. I told my, my stories. There were so many people who reached out to me after that class, specifically white women who'd said, Tunde, I've never taken your class before and I never took your class because we look different. And because we look different, I didn't think we'd have anything in common. And I appreciated that they said that and they said it publicly, not just like a DM, but like a public message on their page. Um, and I knew I knew what that took. In the same breath, I also, as I thanked them, I also asked them if you would not invest 20 minutes in me in a cycling class simply because we look different, could you then invest two years or 20 years in a, can in a candidate if you're in charge of hiring at your company. There were white men who reached out to me who said, uh, Tunde, I didn't take that class. I refused to take that class. My wife made me watch that class. I found the term Black Lives Matter incredibly offensive. And now after watching that class, I see you, I stand with you, Black Lives Matter. Um, yeah, it's so much more than just a bike. I, there's also people that reach out and said, Tunde, you're the only black person who's ever entered my home. And that's by virtue of a touchscreen. I opened our conversation, Scott, by saying that I wrote the book because I think that we focus so much on how we are different. And yet we're so alike and we don't always focus on that. But I think that because we don't always recognize how we're so alike. And when we're vulnerable enough to share the stuff that we're going through, we see ourselves in each other. And so to be able to be a bridge, be the commonality for someone, um, representation matters, but I don't think that representation matters only for the group that's being represented. So my space as a black woman uh, at Peloton, this global platform, it's not just important for young black girls look like me, but also the little white kids or Latin kids, because I think that that's where we see where that's when we see ourselves in other people that don't look like us and we form allyship. And so representation matters, yes, but not just for the group that that's being represented. Tunde, it's actually a lovely transition. This may seem like a trivial topic, but it's not. And this is about your hair. You write about your hair in the book. You dedicate a significant part to it after this ride, because there are certain expectations that you reminded me that society, perhaps American professional society, has certain prejudices, unconscious biases about black women's hair. Talk to that and talk about the decision about your hair. Remind all of us that look like me what our, often our expectations are about women who look like you. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I remember my first Peloton audition. I didn't get the job. I'd had really long, uh, like dreads, braided dreads. And the second time around, I made the conscious decision. I said, "Well, let me take my braids out. Maybe the braids were too much." And so I just had my hair in a slick back, really long, dark ponytail. And going into the role, once I once I did get the job again, I made a conscious decision. Uh, well, rewind. I started with braids in my hair. I had dreads again. Uh, when I first started taking, started working at Peloton, there were like 500 people taking my class. And in the grand scheme of the number of people that take Peloton classes, it just wasn't a lot. Right. And so, uh, but by any given other platform or exercise, 500 people is a lot, obviously. Um, and so I, remember thinking to myself, I remember wondering why people were not taking my class. And so I said, is it the music I'm playing? Is it something I'm saying? And so I decided, I was like, I'm gonna take my braids out and just see. And so I wore my hair, slick, straight, ponytail. Um, and I remember the way that I was received. I remember, you know, it was just 
how do I say it? It was like the 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 compliment. And in the back of my head, when people said, oh, my God, I love your hair like this. My thought was, well, did you hate it before when I wore it in a natural style, braids being a natural style? And so I remember, you know, my entire life I've wanted to cut my hair, but I've always been so um, afraid of what people would think about me or how people would, might presume to know, think they knew who I was purely based on the way that I looked because my hair was short. Um, and so I think it was my 35th uh, birthday-ish, something around there, not the birthday, but I was 35. I decided that I was going to do it anyways, regardless of what people thought I wanted to do it for me. And so I cut my hair off and I wore a wig for maybe a week in class because I didn't want anybody to know that I cut my hair off because I wanted to form an opinion about my hair first. Meaning if I loved it, I wanted to love it because I loved it and not because people told me that I should love it. And on flip side of that, if people hated it and said nasty comments, I was already secure in the fact that I loved it. And so I allowed it to just be my thing. Um, and then, you know, there was the day I decided I went to work that day and I didn't wear the wig, I took the wig off. Um, and I mean, it was, for the first time, I felt like I was fully allowing myself to be seen. Like I'd taken off the mask, I'd taken off everything and I'd allowed myself to be seen. I don't know that I'll wear my hair short forever, um, but there is a beauty, there is a power in feeling beautiful when you strip everything away. And I think that that for me has, um, it's been the, the biggest learning. Like I, I, once I cut my hair off, I was, I said to myself, there's never, I will never allow myself to not do something that I want to do based on the way that other people, uh, based on the way that other people may perceive me for, for it. And so that was the, the biggest takeaway and biggest, biggest learning from the big chop. Hallelujah to that. Your book is called Speak. Speak stands for surrender, power, empathy, authenticity, and knowledge. Of all the nuggets I took away, I want to end our discussion today. And it's been lovely getting to know you. Thank you for the energy you bring. Life happens not to you, but for you. I think the page that had the biggest impact on me is when you shared this sort of pithy statement. You say, and you have no idea what I'm going to share right now. You say, and before I share this, I'll tell you, in the last 60 days, I lost my father. My wife lost her father. We've had both of our mm -hmm. fathers pass in the last 60 days. It's been a traumatic time in our own family. You write, through life, we choose the memories that we store. And you write further, moments that seem insignificant gain value over time. And maybe that's true or not true for everyone. But talk about the power of sort of deliberately choosing the memories that we store and do you have any insight around that can be perhaps good or maybe burdening to people? Yeah, first and foremost, um, I'm so sorry for, for Thanks, both of your losses. Um, I think that, you know, you just repeated what I said, everything is happening for me, not to me. Everything's happening for you, not to you. I think that when you, if you believe that, you can look at it as something that's so scary, or you can look at it as freedom. Like the, you can look, you can be fearful knowing that everything around you is happening and it's happening for you. And even when you're in uncomfortable moments, those uncomfortable moments were, were, were in place there for you. And that can be fear. You can look at that with fear or you can have freedom in that freedom to know that everything is going to be okay. I, when I lost, um, you know, those, my three family members within six years of one another, I went, I was in a, I was in a dark space. I was in a bad space, bad space. Um, I think what helped to pull me out of that was this idea of knowing that I don't get to choose what happens to me in life, but I do get to choose how I react. I don't get to choose what happens, but I do get to choose how I react. In losing them, 
I stepped into the greatest version of myself. I would do anything, Scott, to have any one of them back for just one moment. And still, I say in losing them, I stepped in to the greatest version of myself, resilience that I didn't know existed. Surrender, power, empathy, authenticity, and knowledge. That's the acronym. When I surrender, it results in change, change that leads to growth. Power is connected to my purpose, not how much I can bench press or squat, but my purpose. When I'm living in purpose, on purpose, and being of purpose, when I can find out how to do that, that's my power. For me, my power is that tingly thing that I feel when I know that I'm here with great intention. For me, that's usually when I'm leading, being of, of, of a service by leading. Empathy, I speak to as being rooted in love, not just love for other people, not just empathy for other people, but self-love. Mm. I cannot mm. love you fully if I don't know how to love myself first. Authenticity, I define as the intersection of truth and trust. When you trust yourself enough to show up in your truth as you truly are, to wear the thing, to say the thing, to be as you are, that's authenticity, trusting that you're okay, you're enough. And then lastly, knowledge. The past informs the future. Echoes of the past inform the future. Every missed step, every opportunity, every missed opportunity has led me to this moment. I think about that first job in cosmetics, not knowing how to actually do makeup, but knowing that I had a passion for people, knowing that the knowledge that I acquired in one trade would help me perform in the next. Um, surrender, power, empathy, authenticity, and knowledge. I think that when you can fully show up within each of those elements, if you will, um, you're able to step into the greatest version of yourself. You're able to, to speak, find your voice, trust your gut, get from where you are to where you want to be, speak. What's next for you? You know what? People keep asking me that question. And the truth is, you know, I used to always say that I wanted to be the, the next Oprah. And now I don't say that anymore. I say that I want to be the first tune day. What's next is I want to fully step into a space where I can fully where I can fully enjoy everything that's happening. I think that we are so quick to provide a life to live in that we forget to live. And so right now I'm trying to just live and I'm trying to absorb every day. I'm trying to um, find my true self. Like, who am I really? Like, what do I enjoy to do or jo enjoy doing? How do I enjoy this moment that I'm in? I was at the White House with Elton John the other day. Like, how do you fully enjoy every the fruits of everything? And so that's my focus. And, and I say that's my focus because I know that life is with all with everything that I've um, been been blessed and fortunate enough to receive and to provide for myself. I know that this is still just the beginning. I know that there's more coming, and so I want to get really, really rooted in the framework of being so fully in moments so that as the many more moments come, I'm able to fully absorb and enjoy those moments. And so there will be a tune day, some type of show hosting something one day. And so we're gonna put that out in the universe as well. Tune day, are you nay? Your book is Speak, Find Your Voice, Trust Your Gut, and Get From Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Thank you for joining us today. On, on leadership, and we'll have you back to announce the new program featuring you as hosting something or whatever. We'll see you again. <laughs> we'll see you again. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.